Hello and welcome back to The Thought Cafe, where curious people discuss things that matter. I'm Julia Nadeau, your host for this series. And I'm Jonathan Corbier, and I'll be co-hosting today's episode. Back in 2017, Canada was celebrating its 150th anniversary since Confederation. Thought Cafe was contracted to create a series for CBC that celebrated various industries, technologies, and people from around Canada showcasing the successes of the last 150 years and where we're going in the future. One of the topics we wanted to focus on was how Canada was moving forward with a renewable energy future. We had the great opportunity to interview David Suzuki and asked him about not only the previous 150 years of Canada's leadership, but also the challenges that we face with climate change. Dr. Suzuki is a renowned Canadian scientist and environmental activist. He's best known for his CBC series, The Nature of Things. To start off our discussion, we asked him what the Indigenous communities and elders he's worked with say Canada was like 150 years ago. I wish I could imagine what Canada was like 150 years ago. But listening to my elders in the Indigenous community, wow, Canada was like nothing we can even imagine today. I mean, fish coming into the streams in numbers so great that you could literally walk on their backs. I've walked in streams with salmon where you couldn't help but bump into them when uh, you crossed the creek. But the idea that they were so numerous, you could literally walk on them because they were so packed in is unimaginable. Think of, uh, you know, I've been in the delta of uh, Lake Winnipeg and uh, when the uh, fall flyover comes, you go think, oh my God, look at all the, the waterfowl flying over. Then you talk to someone who's lived there 70, 80 years and they say the sky would, you know, I think it's amazing when you say, see maybe 10 V-shaped uh, flights of geese flying at one time. They say it literally was darkened. The sky was darkened because the waterfowl were, were so thick. Uh, and of course, forests everywhere. We have this tiny, tiny park on Vancouver Island called Cathedral Park, where the trees are just, they're like the movies you see in, uh, in Star Wars. You know, a lot of them have been shot in the Dreadwoods in California. It's just like that in Cathedral Park, except you realize it's a postage stamp. This is what all of Vancouver Island was at one time. Now it's this tiny, tiny little bit of old growth that's been left by the logging company. So you start extrapolating to what natives lived in 150 years ago, it was totally different. But even within my lifetime, I was in a, a small a native village called uh, Fort Simpson on uh, Fort Rupert on uh, Vancouver Island. And there the elders said when the Great Depression hit, you know, after the stock market meltdown in 1929, the Fort Rupert people weren't even aware there was a recession because there were a lot of fish in the oceans, there were a lot of deer. They had no idea that how much people were starving in the rest of the, uh, the country. So that must be what it once was. You know, the, the oceans filled with fish, with whales, with seals, beyond anything we can imagine today. And the same with our rivers and lakes and our land, uh, rich with, uh, with animals and forests. We just have no idea. Today, there are none of those things. And the kids don't remember. And I think this is a problem. What is our baseline? What do we compare today with? We have no idea what it once was when the forests and the oceans and the rivers were filled with animals. We just don't remember that. I've uh, had the pleasure of um seeing David Suzuki talk a few times um, and also we've worked with him a couple times on various projects and I think I was very impressed with you know the passion and the conviction that he brings uh, to the way that he you know answers questions and gives talks and stuff he's clearly someone who is really moved and motivated but I think he's also someone who's not afraid to show his anger about certain issues and I personally like that um, he's not one of these people that's trying to be too polite all the time. Next, we asked Dr. Suzuki to give us his thoughts on the current state of climate change. You know, the basis, the physical basis for climate change has been known since the 1800s. We've known it as a physical phenomenon that certain molecules, including water vapor, will allow light to pass through, but then trap it like the glass in a greenhouse. 
uh, and keep that heat close to the, the planet. And in fact, it's because of greenhouse gases that in fact life was possible on Earth. They've trapped heat and smoothed out the temperature uh, variations from day to night. If you go to Mars, which has a very thin uh, thin atmosphere, in the daytime you boil, at night you freeze because there's nothing to keep that heat and even it out. If you go to Venus, which is covered with clouds 24 hours a day, like all, all day, the temperature there will melt lead. It's over 600 degrees. So we know that we're very lucky to live on Earth where there was that proper balance of water vapor and methane and other things to keep the the planet nice and toasty, and life could evolve then under that uh, those conditions. What has happened in more recent times is that through primarily industrial activity over the last 200 years and the use of fossil fuels as our primary energy generator, then we've been releasing uh, vast amounts of carbon dioxide, which the planet evolved to absorb. Before there were plants, the air was filled with water, water vapor and carbon dioxide. Plants then discovered photosynthesis, began to remove carbon dioxide and put oxygen back in. And over hundreds of millions of years, plants made the atmosphere we depend on. To this day, all of the green things in the ocean and on land are taking carbon out, putting oxygen back in. But our engines breathe as well. Every motor that we've made that uses a fossil fuel is emitting more and more carbon beyond anything the planet can reabsorb. At the very time we've ramped up our production of carbon, carbon dioxide, we're cutting down our forests, which are the best carbon capture and storage uh, system we've got. We're cutting them down at a phenomenal rate. So in terms of, well, what's the problem and what do we do? Clearly, We've got to bring our carbon dioxide levels back to where the amount emitted will equal the amount being reabsorbed. And clearly the best solution is nature's solution, which is trees. And so I think the challenge of our time is not to find some cockamamie idea like capturing the carbon and sticking it in the ground and hoping it'll stay down there, you know, carbon capture and storage. I think the challenge of our times is reforest the planet. Stop all the cutting that's going on in old growth forest and reforest the planet. And that ultimately in a few hundred years will e equilibrate. But at the same time, we've got to stop pouring so much carbon into the atmosphere and keep making the problem worse. So I love particularly this approach that I think it often is overlooked uh, about reforesting the planet. It's very simple, it's very direct. And I think it's something that governments, for some reason, don't take seriously enough. We followed up by asking Dr. Suzuki about Canada's Arctic, its relationship to climate change, the Indigenous people who live up there, and how Canadians view our Arctic. Canadians really have a kind of uh, mystical uh, worship of the Arctic. They all talk about the Arctic as a part of our identity and who we are. Uh, but very, very few Canadians will ever go up to the Arctic and experience it. Nevertheless, for over 40 years, the Inuit, the people that live there in the Arctic, have been telling us something's going on with weather and climate. You know, they're having thunderstorms where they never saw such things before. The ice is getting strange. So here are people who uh, understand ice. They depend on their knowledge of ice for their very survival. And yet they're saying, we don't know how to go out there anymore. The great hunters are going out and they're falling through the ice because the quality of the ice has changed. There isn't as much ice. It's harder to hunt seals. Polar bears are having trouble because there's no habitat for seals to get up out of the water. And so all of the indications from the people who live there have been coming at us for 40 years. And here's where there's that disconnect. We have these romantic ideas of the Arctic. But basically, we don't give a shit what's really happening up there. We wanted to hear Dr. Suzuki's thoughts on the root cause of our inaction when it comes to climate change. If you think back to our origins, science informs us that humans evolved about 150,000 years ago in Africa. That was our, our habitat. And when you try to imagine, you know, you're saying, 
How, what did Canada look like 150 years ago? Try to imagine what Africa looked like 150,000 years ago when we were born. I mean, the plains must have been filled with animals in variety and abundance beyond anything we know today. And you'd have to look hard to see these clumps of four, five, or six of these upright naked apes. And they weren't very impressive. They weren't big, they weren't strong, they weren't fast, they didn't have big claws and fangs. I mean, you gotta say, how the hell could that, could that animal think it's gonna take over the planet? And of course, the secret is, you, what our secret was, hidden. It's that three kilogram mass of protoplasm inside our skulls, the human brain. That was the secret to our success. And that brain in, invented something called a future. No other animal has a sense of a future as we do. The future doesn't exist, right? It's just something we created as an idea. But because we created the idea of a future, we realized based on what we've learned living here and our ancestors have learned, we can predict what might happen in the future. And we can deliberately decide now to avoid danger and exploit opportunity. So you're walking down a path, suddenly the path forks and you go, oh, well, I found something good to, to eat down that side. But when I went to the right side, I ran into a saber-toothed tiger. I think I'm gonna go left. So those foresight, the ability to look ahead was a very, very powerful ability. And now today we have all of the foresight of supercomputers, scientists, who for over 40 years have been telling us we're headed down a very dangerous path. There are alternative ways to go. And now at this critical point, we're ignoring the very quality or trait that got us to where we are, the ability to look ahead. That's the tragedy of our times, that we've got the ability to really look ahead and we've got opportunities to go along a different path. And now uh, we no longer want to listen. So it's interesting to hear um, this common opinion that we've heard many, many times uh, about sort of, you know, what Dr. Suzuki refers to the tragedy of our times. We live in a culture that seems to support short-term ideals and short-term thinking over um, the long-term safety and viability of the species itself. And... Dr. Suzuki talked about this in his description, and, it, and it's strange because if you talk to an anthropologist about our species, Homo sapiens, one of the first things they'll tell you is that our species was named that because we are considered the wise being. And we're considered the wise being because we are the only animal that we understand has the ability to look forward in time and have foresight and see its actions transposed over, you know, the decades that are coming. Um, so the ability to think long term is something that makes us uniquely human and seems to be something that may be our Achilles heel um, in these modern times and is really endangering um, our future. Next, we wanted to ask Dr. Suzuki specifically about the Canadian government's action on climate change and how he would score that. His answer was unsurprisingly um, unapologetic about just how poorly our government up here has been faring. And I think it's interesting to hear him talk about how the rest of the world perceives Canada and our action on climate change and then contrast that to how we are actually faring. Canada is very good at trying to be the good guy and, and take part in environmental discussions. Uh, but, you know, uh, when you start putting it into action, uh, it's not that easy. So Canada has probably has more at risk from climate change than any other industrialized country. We have the longest ocean coastline of any country in the world. Sea level rise, just for, as water warms, it expands. So sea level rise through thermal expansion 
is going to flood Canada more than any other country. And then when you start thinking the ice sheets in Greenland and Antarctica, when they fall in, believe me, the oceans are going to rise not in centimeters, but by meters. And that's going to be, for Canada, catastrophic. And then you think we're a northern nation. We know that the North is heating up much faster with consequences that are going to be enormous. And then you start thinking about uh, the industries that are dependent on, on climate, forestry, fisheries, agriculture, uh, tourism, winter sports. All of these are going to be heavily impacted by the impact of climate change. Well, that being the case, you know, how are we doing? Not very well. We're good at saying, oh, gee, we got to do something. But, you know, in British Columbia, my province, the forest a few years ago turned red because the, the, the mountain pine beetle suddenly exploded and killed our billions of dollars of pine trees. And uh, you would have thought British Columbia would be at the forefront of that, taking action uh, on climate, and we're not. And Canada is not. We had nine and a half very, very bleak years under a prime minister who, de who would not even use the words climate change, who tried deliberately to block government scientists from even talking about climate change to Canadians. I believe this is willful blindness, and that's criminal activity trying to prevent discussion about the most important issue to face Canadians. Having emerged from Harper, the Trudeau government was unbelievable. It was the sun came out, the bells rang, the angels sang. It was wonderful. And, uh, and in Paris, he was outspoken and saying, we not only signed this agreement to limit temperature from rising two degrees, uh, but more than two degrees, we want to try to keep it to one and a half degrees. That was genuine leadership, at least in what he said. Doing it is a vastly different thing. And so what we, the disappointment is our government made the promise in Paris, but implementing that they have failed, they are getting Fs. If they believe in the target of one and a half to two degrees max, we've already used up 1.1 1, 1 .1 degrees. And uh, that doesn't leave a hell of a lot of room. We're still not even capping our emissions. Our emissions are still climbing. That Paris Agreement says at least 80% of the known deposits of oil, coal, and gas have to be left in the ground. Why are we paying any money then to continue to explore for more, more oil? That's crazy. And why, if that's the target, we've got to shut down our use of fossil fuels very quickly. That means the money should be pouring into renewable energy, which right now is competitive. And why are we still spending $3.3 billion at a year, provincially and federally, to subsidize the most profitable sector in society, the energy sector? That's crazy. <clears throat> we shouldn't be subsidizing them. They're making money hand over fist. And that money we subsidize uh, with could be used to build the proper infrastructure, a light rail, uh, uh, public transit, uh, uh, getting into renewable energy. There's a huge opportunity there. And if we believed in the Paris target, and I've written to Mr. Trudeau saying, are you serious about Paris or not? And he wrote back and said, I am very serious about Paris. Okay, why are we talking about building any more pipelines? Why are we talking about continuing to exploit the tar sands? Why are we talking about exploring or exploiting oil in the extreme cases, like out in the oceans, or fracking? Fracking is one of the dumbest ways to get energy you can imagine. It's very energy intensive. You have refuge, refugee or uh, escape methane that makes it uh, fracking, frack gas has a footprint, a carbon footprint print greater than, than coal. And you use vast amounts of water that will never be usable again because it's laced with dozens of different toxic chemicals. To get frack gas is just the dumbest way to get gas. So we ought to be shutting down the extreme sources of fossil fuels, fracking uh, in the oceans and the tar sands, and putting massive amounts into reforesting the planet and uh, renewable energy. Listening to Dr. Suzuki, it's hard not to feel both really depressed about the state of climate change and how little our government is doing about it. He manages to deliver a hopeful message. I think he also 
tries to set the understanding and the precedent that we have a responsibility to sort of practice what we preach. He brings up the fact that, you know, around the world, Canada is often viewed as, you know, a government taking action on climate change. He brings up how Justin Trudeau went to, you know, the Paris COP and really pushed forward a pretty aggressive um, target for climate change. And yet, you know, four years later, the government really hasn't done all that much other than approve more pipelines for the tar sands, which seems to be completely in conflict with reducing carbon emissions. All at the same time, about a year ago, there was a new premier who won the election up here in Canada. His name uh, is Doug Ford. And the first thing he did when he came into office was scrap all the Ontario green energy plans, arguing that if he got rid of them, then he could reduce gas prices by 10 cents a litre. Um, this was a very, very popular thing for people. And again, we, we get back into this situation where we're like, we're talking about a very short-sighted gain, you know, saving 10 cents per liter on gas and losing this huge initiative that existed in a province that was very well known to be a leader um, in moving towards sustainable energy and getting rid of um, fossil fuel use. So it's been a challenge up here in Canada, I think, the majority of people want action on climate change, but it's just not happening. And people get caught up in this short term kind of trickery that politicians are playing, but at the expense of this long term danger that's really standing there, just looking at us right in the face. With so many issues arising from leaving climate change unaddressed, we were curious about Dr. Suzuki's greatest fears for our future. When I first wrote an article about global warming in 19, 1970s, I called it a slow motion catastrophe. I thought it was going to take 70, 80 years. So I was more focused on issues of forestry and fisheries because I thought we had lots of time to fix it. It was only in 1988 that for me was the turning point when I actually met with climatologists and looked at what they were finding. And I said, oh my God, we can't wait. This is so uh, they, we've had a long time to think about it. And we're now realizing the effect of even a tiny change is, is monumental. One of the one parts that really bothers me, worries me, as we increase the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, the interface with the surface of the oceans, which covers 70% of the planet, allows carbon dioxide to dissolve in the water as carbonic acid. So it's lowering the pH. And I've been astonished just that tiny change in the acidity of the ocean. And all hell is breaking loose among shellfish that have to form their shells out of calcium carbonate. The babies can't do it anymore because the acidity is is getting too great. So that was to me a shock, you know, the nature is so fine-tuned to all of these these cycles that its sudden change has repercussions that we can't even imagine. So 20 years from now on the trajectory we're on, there is in my mind absolutely no question that there are going to be hundreds of millions of climate refugees. And quite frankly, for me, the joker in the whole deck is methane. There are massive amounts of methane frozen in the Arctic. And methane is 20 to 80 times more potent to greenhouse gas and carbon dioxide. We already know that the methane is melting in Siberia. You can actually light the bubbles coming out of the oceans. If that, continued, that trend continues, and I don't see anything stopping that trend continuing for another 20 years, all hell may break loose with what ecologists call a methane gun just this sudden huge release of methane that will simply be overwhelm our climate system. And then uh, who knows what's gonna happen. So that's my great fear right now is the methane that's still down in the ground. One of the major things Dr. Suzuki brings up is this whole idea of a large scale methane release um, that could occur um, inside the, you know, melting permafrost. I think it's technically referred to as the clathrate gun hypothesis. The fact that there are these massive pools of methane gas trapped underneath Arctic ice um, can 
present itself as a, a very, very intense um, danger uh, to our climate system. And, and I don't think anyone really knows what exactly can happen, you know, if one of these giant um, methane holes release or if a bunch of them start to release consistently. Finally, we wanted to ask Dr. Suzuki what his dream for the future was and and try and get a more positive outlook on the path that we can take. My greatest dream is that we all say, okay, Canada is very vulnerable to this. We've got to do everything as it's a war on climate now, and we've got to throw everything into it. And you know what? I guarantee you, if we throw all of our efforts into it, we will reap benefits that we can't imagine today. You know, just because the state said we got to get to the moon first, every year NASA publishes a magazine called Spinoff. It's dozens of technologies that have resulted from the space program. Who would have thought that we'd have 24 hour uh, a day television or, uh, networks? Who would have thought we had laptops or ear thermometers or space blankets? There are literally hundreds of spinoffs that have resulted just from that simple commitment, let's get to the moon first. And I absolutely guarantee you the same thing will happen once we say the energy of the future is renewable energy. And the area of batteries in terms of solar panels, like there's going to be, it's happening now, a revolution. We're at the beginning of a revolution. You know, every building should be covered in solar panels. And uh, Elon, Elon Musk has got... Uh, 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 roof uh, roof tiles now that are solar panels that are competitive with regular uh, roof tiles. So I think we're at the beginning of a, a fundamental revolution. The critical thing in all of this, we don't know where we're going to end up. Make the commitment. And the commitment is for our children, the sake of our children and our grandchildren. Make the commitment to reduce the uh, greenhouse gases, and I guarantee benefits will, will accrue to that. I won't be around to live up to my guarantee, but uh, I, uh, my bet is that it, it, there will be benefits that we haven't even dreamed of. You know, France is now building a thousand kilometer highway where the road is built of solar panels. It's gonna power hundreds of thousands of homes. We're just at the beginning of a revolution. Thank you to Dr. David Suzuki for joining us and to you for listening. Make sure to head to the Thought Cafe YouTube channel to watch the animated version of this interview.